There is a lie that is spoken to men far too often, and today I'm going to expose that. Welcome to Fathering Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift, and I'm not the perfect dad, but every day I am trying to be better. Far too often, I hear men making this claim and the statement to other men, and I do not believe that they are trying to be deceptive, but what they state is false. Today, I'm going to bring a corrective that we, especially as Christian men, husbands, and fathers, need to know. If you're a dad who wants to embrace your God-given mission, make sure you subscribe to Fathering Our Future wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also get more content on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you want even more than that, then head over to www.fatheringourfuture.com. Well, I realize it is the holiday season. This is a time where we smile, where we are polite to everyone. We are just filled with love. It's the holiday season. It's the season of giving. We are chipper and we are happy. And my topic today might not sound like it really falls into that context, and it maybe doesn't. But I do know that this is the time where we are also planning for the next year. We're thinking about how we'd like to improve, what we would like to do different. We're drafting our resolutions. And I think what I'm going to talk about today, the corrective that I'm going to bring to the table is going to help us in how we actually draft our goals, our resolutions, and the plans that we have for our life. Now, I have another episode that's going to come out on New Year's Day that talks about something related to resolutions that I think you should listen to before you start pursuing those things. But for today, I have to bring this corrective. I hear men talk about this all the time. And for men who don't claim a Christian biblical faith, that's one thing. They get to choose how they live their life, what they believe, what guides them. But for us, who claim to be Christian fathers, Christian men, Christian dads, our beliefs, our values are rooted in the scriptures. If we are to bring up our children in the training and the instruction of the Lord, if we are to truly fulfill the mission of fatherhood, to equip and to disciple our kids to be a part of God's mission in a greater capacity than ourselves, we have to do so with a strong, biblical understanding. We don't have to understand every little detail of the Bible. You don't have to be able to speak fluent Hebrew and Greek. You don't have to be on that level, but you do have to have a strong stance in your biblical understanding. There are some things theologically that you need to have solidified. And this is one of those things that as Christian fathers as Christian men, we have got to understand, that we have got to embrace. What is spoken too often, and sometimes even by Christian men, is this statement. You are in control of your life. You have the ability to control the outcome. You have control. That is a lie. It might not come from a place of deception, so maybe it's not necessarily a lie, but it is 100% false. You and I are not in control. Now, this is often spoken in line with, you're in control of your life. So if you want particular things, you just have to put in the work and you can control the outcome. I know it's intended to be motivational and uplifting, and it's intended to inspire men to get up and to just move forward and make things happen. I'm here to tell you that cannot be your perspective or pursuit or mindset as a Christian man, husband, father, because It is in opposition to what the scriptures actually teach us. Now, I'm a man. 
like you, I can relate on several fronts. I know that as men, we often share some common pursuits in this life. I think most of us want to have money, and we want to have a lot of money because we know that money is super helpful. Money can alleviate stress. Money can grant you opportunity. Money, in a sense, can almost buy you some time, which is another thing that we want, that we pursue, whether we try to find the dream job, whether we try to just make enough money so that we don't have to work, or we work for ourselves so that we can control our own hours. We want time. We also want money. The Bible even tells us that money answers all. Another thing that we want as men is we want recognition. We want to have reputation. We want to be a person of integrity, and in some small way, we want others to see that. We want recognition, reputation. We want money. We want time. We want success. Now, there might be some nuances to how we frame that, but those are typically elements that fall into the success bucket that we're trying to fill up. And it's not like those things are bad. They're not wrong. Now, if they have you, then it becomes a problem. But if you can actually control yourself and how you deal with those things, you're okay. And I think a lot of people, they look at the Old Testament and they see these huge figures in the Bible. They see people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They see David, Solomon. They see Job. And you look at all of these characters, and what do you see? Well, you see reputation and recognition. You see that they have tons of money and resources. And because of that, they've got time. They have what we still strive for today. And I know some people will tell you that you just have to speak into existence. You say what you want, and it will happen. There's a proper context to those ideas and to those verses. For example, let's talk about the woman and the unjust judge. People often like to go to this, and they'll tell you that if you want something in life, you just go to God consistently and persistently, and if you bug God enough, he'll cave in. As if God is not all-powerful, not all-knowing, not in complete control, and that we somehow can be so powerful in our annoyance to God that he will just cave to shut us up. That's not what that parable is trying to teach us. The context of that parable was in regards to justice, that this is how we should go to God for the sake of justice, that we should constantly be praying to God for his righteousness and justice to come to earth. That's what that is. It's not about whatever you want. It's about justice. We've got these bad ideas, and we think that if we just write it down and we speak it, that it will happen, that we have the control of the outcomes of our life, and we do not. I'm not against goal setting. I'm not against speaking the things that you want verbally. I think all of those are great. I think In many ways, they do help us. In some cases, they do work, but they are not guarantees. We do this other thing with fasting. People think that if I starve myself, that eventually God will cave in because he loves me so much that he won't let me die of starvation and he'll do what I want him to do. That's manipulation. And that is not what Isaiah instructs us about fasting. We just, we take things sometimes out of the Bible, and we attempt to use them for our gain and selfish benefit. And that is not the intent. That is not what we do. And I'll say this, I don't care how much money you have, you're still not in control. I don't care how strong you are, how healthy you consider yourself to be, you're not in control. You don't even know what happens 10 minutes from now. You might have a meeting scheduled, but you don't know if it actually happens. You don't know how that meeting goes. 
You don't know if you make it home from work today. You don't know what happens the rest of today, tomorrow, or the years to come. You don't know. You don't know if sickness comes into your house. You don't know if you'll celebrate Christmas with your entire family next year. You don't know. There are things outside of your control. You cannot keep yourself from getting sick. There are just things that we cannot control. If you're going to have control, you have to have knowledge. And we don't know everything. We don't know everything. You can probably think to a situation that you have been present in where this usually happens at an event or a restaurant, but everything is just falling apart. And one person is running around frantically trying to point people into different directions to do different things. And if you stop and ask them, I need to see someone in charge, they'll tell you, I'm in, I'm in charge. I have this under control. They have no idea what's going on. And because they have no idea what is going on, they cannot have control. We don't have all knowledge. Therefore, we are not in control. But there's some other things biblically that help us with this idea and with this concept that prove to us we're not in control. One of the things is we're not our own. The Bible tells us that we were bought with a price. If you profess to be a Christian, you don't claim to be your own. You claim to be God's. You don't live to fulfill your will and your mission. As a Christian, you are invited to be a part of God's will, of God's mission. We're not doing our own work. There's a fallacy that floats around that really messes a lot of people up. People will ask God and pray, Lord, what is your will for my life? You will never once find that prayer in the entire Bible. No one ever prays for, God, what is your will for my life? What is your will for me? Because it's called God's will for a reason. It is God's will singular. We are invited to be a part of what God is doing. We are invited to be a part of his mission. Ephesians 2, we are saved by grace through faith that is a gift from God to us, not of what we do to obtain this status, but through that we are made a masterpiece by God, created to do good works that He preordained. He has a plan. He has a will. He has a mission. And through His redemptive act, we are invited to be a part of what He is doing, not what we want to achieve. This is not about us. This is about him. This is about what he is doing. Let me take you to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, just to give you a better picture of what I'm trying to convey. Hebrews chapter 11 is often referred to as the hall of faith. Because as you begin to read, you'll read about patriarchs and matriarchs of the faith, the great things that they did. And most of the verses will say the name of the individual, the situation that they were in, and in spite of that situation, they chose to do this. And on and on it goes for most of the chapter. And so we get this idea that if I'll just have the faith of Daniel, I'll get out of this situation. If I am just faithful, like Abraham and Moses, God will see me through, and that will be the success story of my faith. But if you keep reading, you'll stumble across some verses that might mess up your theology a little bit. Because the writer of Hebrews begins to talk about other people, other people that the writer doesn't know. There's no name given because there was no name recorded. Because they chose to be faithful, but when they were tossed into the lion's den, they didn't come out the next day. 
when they went before kings and execution was the sentence, it was carried out. They weren't rescued from the consequence of their faithfulness. And the writer of Hebrews says something so profound. The world itself was not worthy of these people. As fathers of faith, as Christian men, husbands, and dads, it is wrong for us to think that if we are faithful and that if we do what is right, that we will get the things that we want out of this life. That's basically parallel with prosperity gospel. That if you do all the good things, that financially you'll be favored and blessed. That's not even a biblical idea. It happens to some, but it is not a promise and it's not a guarantee. Because when you read the rest of Hebrews 11, you see that faith doesn't always unfold the same way. What it means to really be faithful, it means that even though you are not in control, you still choose to do what's right. You still choose to get up and to put forth your best effort and to be the man that God has called you to be, even though you might never obtain the material things that you desire. Because remember, Jesus has already won. He already has victory. He's already obtained the true success. It is promised to us. We might not get everything in this life, but more than we can even comprehend is waiting and prepared for us already. Being a father of faith is not thinking, I'm in control, I can control my outcome, I am going to do this, I am going to achieve this, I am going to get the things that I want. That mentality is rooted in selfishness, and this is not a selfish lifestyle that we claim as Christians. It is a selfless lifestyle. We are not in control. And we have agreed to that. We sign up for that because we realize that it is not in us to direct our path. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. We put God in control. We allow God to be sovereign as he is and to dictate and control what happens in our life. And we trust no matter what happens. That is the perspective that as Christian dads, we have to have. I know you want a bunch of money. I know you want a nice house. I know you might want a car that can actually get you from A to B. You might not even want a nice car. You might just want something that you don't have to work on every other week. I get it. I understand. But being faithful says, even though everything in life might not be sunshine and rainbows, I'm going to choose to be faithful because I see the redemptive work that God has done, and I see what he has called me to be a part of. I get to be a part of his mission. God has shared with us this ministry of reconciliation. We get to go out as ambassadors of the kingdom, as witnesses of the gospel, and we get to be a part of what God is doing. That's what we get to do. God is leading the way. We are following in the footsteps of Christ. He is in control, not us. And we rest in that. We trust in that, that God is in control. It's like what the psalmist David writes about in Psalm 23. God is our shepherd. He leads us. Sometimes we're in areas where the grass is just plush and the waters are clear and still. It's refreshing to our soul. We find ourselves on this path of righteousness. But other times God leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. 
but even there we do not fear. It's the same as us being in the presence of our enemies, surrounded by opposition and adversity, but we know that even in the midst of the heartache and the pain, there is a Savior who has prepared a table, and He is inviting us to come and to sit and to dine and to be with Him in the midst of all the things that we dread. And we have this knowledge that even though we're not leading our own lives, even though we are not in control, goodness and mercy follow us, and we will reach our destination. We've got to stray away from this idea that we are in control, because we are not, and we never will be. God is in control, and it's in His sovereignty and His dominion that we trust. Now, there's one other thing that I want to say in reference to this. Going back to this idea of, God, what's your will for my life? There is no such thing. There is God's will. There is God's mission. And I talk about the mission of fatherhood being to equip and to disciple our kids to be a part of God's mission in a greater capacity than ourselves. But what is that mission? That mission that we have is to go out as his witnesses and to continue reconciling the world to Christ. And we do this in several ways. We don't do this just by being a licensed minister with some organization and standing behind a pulpit and preaching a sermon. That is not how the mission of God is fulfilled by everybody. As a husband, as a Christian husband, when you love your wife, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, you're allowing his light to shine. When you as a Christian father are bringing your children up in the training and the instruction of the Lord, and you are doing your best to serve them and to lead them and to disciple them, you're allowing his light to shine. When you express love and kindness to everyone, to everyone, you're allowing his light to shine. As you live your life according to his instruction, you are being the witness. You are fulfilling the mission. You might never preach a sermon, but your life will exclaim the testimony of Jesus. You don't have to try and pursue all the little things that you want. I'm not trying to stop you from doing that, because I want those things too. I'll be completely honest. I'd like a lot of money. I'd like to be able to do a bunch of things. I'd like to be able to help a lot of people with that money. I've written a bunch of things down that, God, if you'll give me this, this is what I'm going to do. I, I'd like those things. But at the end of the day, I know that if I don't get those things that I think I want, there's already something in store for me that I can't even comprehend, that he's already won for me. And for you too, I'm not in control. I'm going to go out. I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm going to try to be a good steward. I'm going to try to take the talents that God has given me, and I'm going to try and double those and multiply those. I'm not trying to discourage you from thinking, well, if I'm not in control, then it's not worth me getting up and doing anything. I want you to have some pursuits, but you need to be willing to have those pursuits even though you might never obtain the things that you want because you're not living a life of faith for yourself. You're doing it because of what he has done for you, because he is in control, because he has purchased you with a price, because you're getting to be a part of something beyond yourself. You are a part of God's mission as a man, as a husband, and as a father. And everything else that follows that you get to do, you get to do it with all of your might as unto the Lord. And in that, you allow your light to shine. So here's what I want you to take away. If you hear someone tell you you're in control, you're in control of the outcome of your life, take a, take a note from the, the penguins of Madagascar. Just smile and wave, boys. Just smile and wave. And just know that I'm not in control, but I'm okay with that. 
because I know who is. And because he's in control, I choose to wake up and to strive for greatness, not for myself, but because I have been graced with the opportunity to be a part of a mission greater than myself. I get to be a part of God's mission. That's the mindset that we have to have as Christian men, husbands, and fathers. That's what I want you to take away from this. You're not in control, but that's okay. Because living the life of faith is being faithful, even though you know you're not, you're not in control. Because you know who is. So, I want you to take that away, and I want you to make sure you listen to the episode that drops on January 1, 2024. Think about this as you make your resolutions. I'm not trying to say, you know, don't try to make more money, don't try to grow your business, but make your resolutions in line with this idea, with this theology of, I want my resolutions to be an act of my faithfulness regardless of the outcome. While I might want success and I want, and I might want some money in the process, I might want this or I might want that, whatever it is that you want, you might want a ton of things. You keep those as like, hey, I, I really like these if all this stuff can happen. But change your mentality of I'm going to do these things because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to do these things because I'm a child of the king. I'm going to do these things because I'm on a mission, a big mission that's greater than myself that I'm privileged to be a part of. And just choose to be faithful in the things that you do. Now, this is the last time you'll hear me until Christmas Day. I, I have an episode that drops on Christmas, but listen to it a different time. Don't listen to it on Christmas Day. Spend that time with your family. Again, it's the giving season. It's the holiday season. Enjoy it. I hope that you've not procrastinated. I hope you get to enjoy the time that your kids have off from school and that you get to just be together with your family. Treasure these times, value these moments, and draw closer to God, to your wife, to your kids, and to your community. And remember, you don't have to be in control, and you're not anyway. So if you think you are, well, it's a big uphill battle that will <laughs> not end favorably for you. But that's all I've got for you today. This is Father in Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift. Thank you so much for being with me, and I hope you will join me next time. Thank you again for listening to Fathering Our Future. If this episode has served you or you believe it will serve another dad in the future, make sure that you leave a like, a comment, a review, or share this so that it can reach another dad. And so that you don't miss out on another episode, make sure you subscribe to Fathering Our Future wherever you listen to podcasts. And again, for more great content, head over to www.fatheringourfuture.com.